So my artistic research project is Culture Together, an artistic research on the fulldom medium as an epidemic, epi <laughs> epidemic, epistemic instrument for shared virtual reality experiences. I will talk a little bit about the full dome format in general, what it is, and then I will go into my first artistic work, which I realized, or which was realized now in the last few months in this uh, PhD project. So first of all, I want to talk a bit about uh, virtual reality immersion, that which represents a shift of digital image formats. So this term virtual reality and immersion, this came up with a lot of promises to change and alter our daily lives in the late 80s, at the same time when the internet was coming up, there was a big hype, but somehow uh, VR never fulfilled this prophecy, which was uh, named uh, like internet did. So now uh, we believe, I believe uh, that now technology, the technological advancement um, went so far that this is now going to take place, these changes of, uh, sorry, my phone is ringing all the time. Uh, so, uh, what I wanted to say that now immersion or the technology which generates these immersive spaces, virtual reality spaces, uh, is in so much advanced in its technological context that we can say it is also about to change our social uh, life and our daily life. It, we are, we, it is infiltrated all over. In our, in, we have it, uh, 360 YouTube channels, we have all these 360 cameras. There's a lot of, 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 uh, hype and development taking place, but uh, I feel there's little uh, redefinition about really what these formats mean. So that's why I'm working on this idea of a research in a virtual reality environment, which is a full dome, which is opposed. So where a full dome where several people can meet and share socially together these type of immersive spaces. Differently as opposed that uh, the head-mounted displays, which is a social, e which is a non-social experience where you're alone in a space or alone in your virtual environment setup, and you have to, uh, you cannot share this, this this encounter with other people. So there's a big difference about how, first of all, how to generate this type of of spaces. Even so, the technology is similar, but also how to how do we address certain aspects inside there. For sure, this is just now an image. You can see it is very interesting to see maybe other people while they are inside a virtual headset exploring some physical imagery. But um, it is still very different than an immersive experience where we are all together. So just let me go for the uh, historical context. So the full dome stems somehow from planetariums which is the background of the scientific milieu. So what we see here is the Jena Planetarium in 1923, one of the first planetariums. By that time, these were star projectors, which, were, which are used to project the image. In the late 80s, in the development, this is called the Omnimax, which is an I, which is called, uh, which is an I dome, which is kind of a certain variant of the IMAX cinema. And it was developed in the 70s. It's the San Diego Hall of Science. This is not a real full dome, but it's one of the precursors. Why I say not real full dome? Because it has a projection only on the front side. So we are, it's a bit more like an IMAX set scenario. Then in the late 80s, the first digital systems came into several planetariums. So that meant that the digital medium, uh, the possibility of projecting digital images into these full dome environments offers a new range of artistic possibilities. So we can say that today a lot of spaces are popping up all over the world. At the same time, planetariums are adjusted to the full dome medium, and we have different type of versions. So this, for example, is a tilted dome, which, we, which is often used also a little bit like this uh, Omnimax dome, which I showed earlier where we are more in a, in a kind of an IMAX situation, we are, we are semi-immersed. I will talk a little bit later what that means. And these spaces all around the world, we can say at the moment we have around 200 theaters, which are uh, uh, capable of presenting this type of materials. And there's some, some studies out that they are going to end up in the next three, four years, which up to six, 700 spaces. For example, the Technical Museum also has a little dome now, the Angewandte has a little research dome, and uh, the planetarium wants to change also into this format, so there is a real move also to these 
full dome environment in that sense where it is really this shared social experience and not only the head mounted experience. When I talk about full dome, uh, I say full dome is not equal full dome. That means uh, the classical definition of a full dome. Classical means in the scene of the full dome environment, which is not at the moment still not yet so much inhabited by artists. It is more with artistic science or edutainment situations. So we have a lot of educational aspects taking place. But uh, there, the dome is. Has, if you look at this dome, for example, has only a spring line until 180 degrees. So when you see this black line, this is a dome which is 180 degrees, has a 180 degree format. The full dome which I am talking about and where our research is, where the research is taking place, is a 210 degree dome. So like this is a little version of, of a 210 degree dome. The big difference is that in a planetarium type of setup where you have 180 degree, you have a different image format, so you don't see, for example, the horizon. Like, for example, you see in this image, uh, the, the spring line would start here, the 180 degrees, so all this part is not part of the image in classical full dome theater. So there is a trend, uh, trend also now in that, if you can call this a scene, but in this movement of several people who are building this, to expand to this 210 degrees because there, there is a very different immersive experience. So we can say that the Fulham experience is one of the most immersive and engaging ways of supporting the interactive presentation of 3D environmental representations to relatively large groups of people. And the impact of immersion can be described as a physical, sensorial and emotional encounter through which the participants experience the very vivid illusion of playing an integral part in the image. So, me, what I'm trying to do is to generate for these type of environments a diversity of artistic dramaturgies for this medium. And for this, I developed already an artistic research framework and I continue to experiment with, and with the goal to advance and document different and new immersive languages and grammars which can be explored and which can generate specific modes of expression for the full medium. So inside this, inside this experience, so I'm showing here images from a previous research project which was the European Mobile Home Lab for Artistic Research. Inside this medium we already uh, exp uh, explored s several aspects which are coming back into my research and I will, will talk a little bit more detail a little bit later about it. Here, for example, is a scene where performers in this space were having the same physical objects like the 3D objects which are inside, which you see this labyrinth of boxes and the performers can navigate and manipulate these these virtual boxes in the real space. So there's an extension there, there was an exploration of extension between the virtual and the real space. So f it is very, w w I'm very much interested in this idea of generating multi-sensory and kinesthetic feedback for the spectators. That's why I name all this interaction mode. So for me, the research is a phenomenon of perception in immersive 360 environment. And that is very important to uh, address this notion, how do we explore vision without being objected to one singular focal point of view. So there is not one point of view which is dominant, like we are used to it in the cinematic framed images. So now we are now talking about trying to generate an image which is 360 degree, not only a panoramic image, but also on top of us. So and here I'm very much interested to explore the protocols and this artistic potential in these type of spaces you can generate. So, in my research, I will generate experiments and artworks that will oscillate between sometimes performance, interactive installation, and an immersive e event. And so, I also want to interrogate and work on this communicational perspective, what the user experience is afforded to the spectator in, the, in their disease environments. So, for me, the dome becomes a kind of a living lab for research into embodied immersive experience. I talk about embodied immersive experience because it is a very physical experience which you can generate, which some of you partly already experienced, and I will show some, some images to this a little bit later. 
Firstly, I want to lay, name out what are the, the threats in which I research in this, in this field. So the first threat is called the narrative threat. And here we can say that since the viewer is immersed in a 360 version and the story can evolve everywhere in the space, so narratives in the photo medium differ therefore very much tra uh, from traditional forms of visually framed narratives. So and here I would like, I'm interested to explore the opportunity to tell a story without this frame and where the narration can sometimes linear, as in traditional cinemas, but also non-linear, so elements taken from the cinema but not necessarily with a consequential logic, and or abstract narratives. So since, because there inside, inside this dome, it is always in the full dome I'm talking now, where we can also move around, it is difficult to anticipate the audience behavior. So where will they position themselves and where will they look at? My, so the research focus therefore on the creation of narratives which will involve this concept of how to direct maybe the physical movement but also the, the spectator's attention at multiple moments in time. So, and therefore the circular projection space of the dome offers a very unique opportunity to compose a story where you have multiple points of attention. The second thread is what I call the real-time interaction. So my background is media arts. I've been doing a lot of uh, responsive environments, interactive environments, and now here in the dome, interaction manifests itself very different. So one of the big questions is how can the public, for example, interact with the dome? Because as in all interactive artworks, the viewer is not purely the contemplator, but he or she becomes also partly the subject or the co-author of the story. So now the question is in the dome environment, how will this interaction with image and or sound be perceived when the responding media elements are not always behind or in front of me, or, but they are above or all around us. So in there, I'm very much also interested so to define this, this potential, but also to explore partly this idea of a single and the idea of a multi-user multi -user interaction. And there, with, this, with this element, the idea is to utilizing props embedded with, our, for example, partly with mobile phones or wearable technologies, and to utilize also the output of these data partly for generative data visualization. So, for example, I would say how to interact with the dome, you can divide this into four elements. And so one, one part is the element of an object, an object that carries interactivity, an object that forces the public to move and strengthen the ex experience which we want to transmit, which can be props, it can be an iPad, a smartphone interface, gloves, specifically made elements. Then the second interaction mode which I'm interested or which I divided into four categories is what I call when you put biometrical sensors on the bodies of the spectators, there the idea is more to connect the spectator and also see what feedback can be generated and re-feedback this, this data into the dome, so to generate some feedback loops, loops in, a, in a kind of an interactive mode. And then the third part is what we call, what I call it when data which is deriving, for example, from track movement of a group of people or of single persons. So this can be done via camera tracking, for example, from the top, or in certain cases, some experiments we made is from the frontal view. There for sure you have a different, a very different perception. So at the moment, the top is more this mode which we or I employ in this in this research. I say we because for sure there is always a group of people involved in these in this type of productions. And the fourth mode which is I would call the interaction which the artwork goes into function only if it will be turned on by the spectators. So a very, a very simple interaction and a very simple mode like pressing a button or where the presence also via camera tracking might, might uh, uh, start, start the interactive mode or like, for example, in the, in the uh, future room, which I will talk later again, there was a, it was a microphone where by speaking into the microphone, you started the interactive mode with, the, with this environment. The third and a very important element in this research is also one of my threats is the audience engagement. So since we can see this full dome as a microscope or a telescope of the real world, 
The question is for us, how does now the brain react to these kind of visual systems? Which are the physical, but also the psychological effects? How big, for example, should the human be, a represented human in these spaces, and how can multiple people navigate within a virtual mm, environment at the same time? These are some of these questions which I try to tackle in the next upcoming three years. And I also want to research and investigate on this problem solving of multi-person, but also, also multimodal interaction. What I mean by this, multi-user interaction is a big topic always in the media arts. How many people can interact and if how do I know that I'm part of this mode? I believe that in a case of a full room 360 degree environment, you can even generate this simpler in a certain aspect because we have multiple points of attraction so I can go into specific, uh, specific intimate states with elements or parts of this environment without controlling everything. Then for sure it is very important for me to investigate how the audience behavior is taking place of these immersive environments which we generate. So there's this idea of for example, moving around, the different kinds of moving around, the sitting down, the lying or the walking, are all different physical modes and change this perception of the space for the spectator. So sitting down, for example, could refer to a single zone of interaction. Lying down refers more to maybe a panoramic use or an experience of the dome. Walking around refers more to an intimate exploratory character of the, of the user inside this dome. And then a fourth thread, very important, is the experience of space. So the perception, how do we perceive space and time inside these, these environments? So the experience of space and time is a, is a combination of sense of scale, but also sense of space and the difference between the dimension of the spectator's bodies and this projection space is a very crucial aspect which has to be addressed when working in the, in the dome. Since the dome is at the same time a physical space, which is defined through our senses, but also a virtual space, which projects a virtual environment, the virtual aspect of the full dome creates therefore a cognitive and a physical experience in parallel at the same time. So this is the notion of presence, which we can talk also in VR research later in the discussion. I can maybe go deeper into this, into this subject, what that means, but this is also related of what we call immersion, but also this idea of presence when I talk about different models are generated is we have one time the cognitive model of the real world which we generate the mental in our mental mind and at the same time we generate the model of this virtual world and these two these and we always negotiate once we are in an environment we negotiate between these two elements we, this is from men now are now still from humans not so long anymore but humans and generated virtual environments and that real world. And that's why we also don't talk only about immersion, but we talk about presence. And that's why we talk also in this idea about degrees of presence, because it's very difficult to measure, to say, okay, how much you feel immersed or how much you feel immersed, but we can measure with different, different ways how strong how strongly your own cognitive process takes place, how much you, even so you know you have this, you're in that dome, you know I'm not there, still it has an effect on you. So there's this constant mode of, of negotiation in your own brain taking place and in your body in the full dome, which uh, is an in and out all the time. And this is what I call the perception of space and time, the physicality, the virtuality, and then there's that one goal to even explore the concept of telematics. Telematics is a very disputed, disputed not, but for myself, disputed mode of communication between spaces because how much is left when we talk between cameras with one which is other. Uh, but I, I think in these dome environments you can, make, can generate quite interesting telematic experiences and this is planned for next year with an English uh, dome which is constructed now at the moment in Plymouth and the dome which we have here in Vienna to try to generate some type of experiences. How can we, how can we live and, and experience this dome with telematic uh, presences of different users? So in, in all these uh, uh, four, uh, four strands, there comes in as a five, the fifth strand, an important part which I called earlier, which already 
pops up in the idea of, of presence, when we talk about presence, it's a factors of immersion. So how much, how much do, do we feel immersed? So for example, do we feel immersed? So the full sensory immersion happens usually, we can say when the dome kind of disappears. So we, get, we lose track of that, of that surface, we lose track of that architecture. And the audience then can feel partly emotionally or physically engagement. So the tools for obtaining a complete immersion of the viewer in this new reality is the screen surface, the projection, and the audience environment. So three, these three elements. And the mo emotional factor of the immersion is whether the storytelling in the film or in the case of, for example, interactive environments, how intuitive the inter this interaction takes place. So the public is always immersed in this virtual reality scenario. And for me, it's very interesting, okay, how do we, how do we negotiate these, these two models, the mental model of the real world and the mental model and the, the model which the virtual environment generates. And in these five threads, which I named, there is one other or two other elements which I could name, which are intertwined there, which I would call is like the navigation in the narrative. So if we have an object and we can even navigate in these spaces, and the navigation may be even related to a physical or virtual model. So there's props or objects which can enter you and you enter into this world. So this is now a little bit a quick overview about my research thread and these agendas which I want, which are where I'm working at. And now I will come to the first embodiment of, of, of my research which took place, this is the future room, which, was a, which is an interactive dome installation in which we are speech recognition. The user and the visitors are invited to choose between 14 different themes that are, or that we identify, that we, this is now the group of conceptors for this project, uh, as crucial topics for the future. Well, that's why we call it the future room. It, it, in this, this installation was realized in the frame of the exhibition of the aesthetics of change. That was the second part in the Museum of Applied Arts here in Vienna. The second part, which was created by Peter Weibel and Gerald Bast with the, with the, uh, the idea to sketch thesis for the future of the arts in the next 30 years and advocated for a reorientation of education, art and society. So we were now, so there, this was a commission, so you see here now our dome, the, that's a research dome also, which is uh, uh, housed at the digital art department. It's a 210 degree dome, it has six meters diameter in the middle. Uh, we lift it a little bit higher that people can more easily slide in and can sit in that space, still it goes down to 210. So you see there where the black, black surface finishes, this is a 180 degree panorama line, which I called, uh, said earlier. So the public is invited to get into this space and when they, when they come into this space, they encounter a word cloud, what we call the word cloud. So these are uh, different clouds of wording, the themes which you can choose, a theme which gives you maybe a dystopic vision, an utopian, utopian vision or an interpretation of these topics. So the topics are artificial intelligence, education, energy, evolution, finance, genome editing, information, quantum physics, migration, politics, religion, urbanization, and work. Here now you see we have sometimes some words were doubled. So first to get it more bigger, but also they have a double meaning. So for example, urbanization or mega cities, they led to the same uh, uh, visualization behind it. Important to say is that these, uh, there is a text layer, and this I can, I give you now these papers. Can you take this, Anna? Mm -hmm. This is just a reference for you. We gave this to the people. This was laid out. So this is like the text layer, which is behind the audio layer, which is behind these visual layers, which are coming. So this is important just to say these are scripts. We call it scripts for human and computer voices. So these texts are originally based from, uh, partly they were done by Gerald Bast and Peter Weibel and some other books, uh, from other books, researchers, which we took, but we all rephrase these texts so that they can fit in a context like this and that they can generate a certain ambiguity. So what is, it's very important. And 
for sure they have a time layer and they are sometimes very questionable, sometimes they are with a question mark, they are hesitating. And what is very important for you to understand also that these voices, which you will hear later on also, they are computer voices. Beside two persons, there was one time Professor Zeilinger who was speaking and Gerald Bast. So Zeilinger, he was Professor Zeilinger, he was speaking about quantum physics and quantum computer, and Gerald Bast was talking about the education. These are the only human voices inside this environment. The rest are uh, from a speech engine generated computer voices, which sound very human. I name this because this is a part which comes later even in the theme of the, of the project. So here I show you now some images from these word clowns. It's just a different point of view, but you can see uh, they generate different kind of architectures and, 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 and spaces. For us, these word clouds are, were a very important part. For me, it was very important because there we could generate really specific immersive experiences which are outside of these very, very dense, condensed uh, uh, text layers which you have once you're in one of these environments. So this, for example, is like a, like a follow spot which opens up. So then the public is asked to, inter to interact and speak into the word. This interaction took place in that form that a, a voice, a, the computer voice, was inviting you to speak in permanently, randomly, differently generated ways to choose one of these words and speak it into the microphone. Here you see, for example, a different word cloud again, which is much more shifting, it's more floating in the air, but it's but very physical because we work with very small small movements and once you start concentrating your if you really get a very physical environment i this one is for example a cloud which is like a tunnel which zooms you into a space we took there was a lot of work into this word clouds we realized during the project later people rarely once they were interacting in this space they rarely took time to even immerse into these situations because they just got so playful they triggered the next scene the next scene the next scene but uh, so there is a little bit something which we have been thinking how do we how can we maybe <laughs> build a layer that maybe this part doesn't get lost because it's a very uh, a strong part inside this dome and in this inside this grammar i'm going through several images i have later some videos to show these are just some bites as you uh, gives you so it gives you some bite or some taste of this environment some glimpses it's very difficult to present dome imagery and dome immersive environments on a two-dimensional screen. We'll try here. So here you have someone speaking into the room and you see the back, you see now I show this also that you see in one, one part always with a point of view what different spaces we generated. And what is very important that these are 14 themes. So these 14 themes, uh, if you look at them, it's uh, at the beginning it was very scary to predict the future of the of evolution, to predict the future of education as an artist. That was something which I, at the beginning, was very resisting. At the end, it became very exciting once we adapted to it because it gave, especially in my research context, gave me the freedom to really go for a multiplicity of grammars and go for the multiplicity of the ideas. How, how can we really stage, stage this type of, of, of complex subjects and that was so for example this is education it starts in a scene you can see for example this a huge library of books which later then explodes and you find later later on you find like a, a three-dimensional max headroom maybe some of you know was max headroom in the 80s a video series a kind of a virtual character speaking to you, to us and to what gerald bass was transformed into a max headroom speaking in this in this uh, a trash of of books pro, uh, pro proclaiming the uh, advocating a new trend for education i'm showing you here now this image because this is what we call a full dome master so this is very important for you maybe just to look behind. So the, all the images which we, you generate for, for a dome image looks like this. So when I'm talking about 
multiple points of view and generating. So once you start to look at this, you might understand how difficult it partly is to anticipate how these movements and how, how do you generate uh, an image when we are used to real, uh, where we have focal point of view, we have close-up, we have edit, counter-edit. So all these techniques which are embedded into uh, our filming languages, they all don't work inside these environments anymore. anymore. And so this is the big part of the of the research, what type of image world can you generate inside these environments. Here, for example, you see an excerpt from Zeilinger, Professor Zeilinger, Anton Zeilinger. This is a point cloud representation of him, but he's in the dome up to four, five, six times present, speaking like a counterpart to himself, sometimes with, with himself, sometimes uh, uh, answering explaining the concept of, of quantum physics and the concept of quantum computer. And he's like floating himself like particles of light inside this space. This, for example, is a scene, another scene of uh, migration. Here you have like the dome becomes like, becomes like a skin of text. This text is uh, the declaration of the human rights, which you're seeing there, which is unfolding. But it unfolds only over time. These words come slowly to an image. So these letters, they change and shift. And after a time, it transforms into an image, which is a collage of several uh, uh, situations, which we know out of war situations and refugee, ca refugee situations. And this is this video, which is uh, the migration video. Here you see some examples from the urbanization or megacities video public lying in the space. This is religion. Religion we, we chose, which is a very difficult topic. <laughs> religion we chose uh, um, internet search type of internet search engine idea of what can be the future of religion. So here you see some different um, images uh, over time, how it proceeds. You can see also how the space changes. And at the end, it goes into what we call this idea of data religion, that data over generates us. So there we have was a bit of a provocation from us that we say, OK, at the end, religion transforms maybe into what we call data religion. This is another image of evolution, a generative situation where people are sitting over time inside this evolution space. This is, again, this should be not in. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, from finance. Finance or economy, we visualized it with the idea of the voices that speak in real time generate different, different uh, waves, like a little bit like the graph waves of the stock market. And these voices, if you look at finance, they speak partly, you will hear a little bit later also in a video, they speak their, these kind of dystopian phrases, sentences, and each time they, these, they generate these, these sound waves, which are, which are generated in real time by the voices. So there's a bit of the idea of synesthesia also inside that, that part. I'm going to switch now quickly into a different program. And my time is, where are we, 30 minutes somehow. I'm, I, I will show you some videos because it did not work in my presentation. Here you see now, for example, people choosing, you see some interaction. For sure, these are always, this is unedited material, it's not color corrected. The sound is not perfect yet. These are just snippets which we show quickly. Just to give you a little bit of an idea how this environment. How will we renew energy? Without new ideas, there will be no future. New rules, new ethics for energy consumption. Will coke and oil only serve as exhibits in a museum? So the sound has some jumps. These are different because we use different cameras. This is, for example, a point of view into a word cloud from really when you're lying on that floor. 
So you see the same scene, but from a different point of view, it manifests itself also very different. So the idea is also that there is not one one point where you look at it, you can look everywhere and you experience a different space and you even experience the media on a different level. This is one of the word clouds now. So now we have some, show you just some snippets of where people chose. This part, for example, is was not visualized, uh, not where I was having my part in. This is from the science visualization lab from Professor Wendelmate. But it's, uh, so they try to really incorporate how genome editing functions in real, such as, as a scientific <laughs> version. This is now what I talked earlier, the education part, where you see the space, how it lifts and how it shifts, which is very interesting in the dome because things which get further away make this, the room very claustrophobic and things which are very close makes it bigger. And there are some very interesting ways and if things function partly very different than our own brain would may, maybe set them together. So here now we have some... Economy. Just some close up from people. It's a bit dark, I'm sorry. <laughs> what, what was very interesting also is because this is when I'm talking about social space, you heard these people now laughing, you hear them interacting, but it's also this dynamic which is taking place. They are sitting in the room and one is too shy to say something and the other one always says, say this, say this. So it's very interesting to have, uh, to have this dynamic between who's going to go on stage and speak and not. Here now I'm talking about different views. People are really guided and looking in different ways through that space. So these are now some snippets from... So this is the finance part, for example, which I talked earlier. These are all computer voices. That's when we talk about the Google search engine, translation engine, the voices they became. But they, are, they are sampled out of snippets from human voices, samples from recording, but it's an intelligent system. This is an Amazon web service. You register with your credit card, you have one million, one million characters for free. We still have some free, so we didn't have to pay it. So, but you can generate, which was, otherwise it would have been not possible to generate this amount of text in such a short, short amount of time in a period of three to four months to generate so much text and even change it. For example, here, this is a scene which is automation of work, which is based on the studies of the automation of labor in the next 30 years, which jobs get killed or which will disappear through automation and one of these jobs and so these jobs they fall off over time you see here a little bit just this move what kind of different dizzy spaces it creates but to the automation what i wanted to say one of these jobs will disappear are speakers radio speakers people who speak so in our production we had this situation already taking place because we needed to use computer voices then uh, taking actors to direct them because it would have been 20 more, 25 times more time. This is now politics, one, one sequence. The which of social media is to conform. Which, for example, when you are in the dome, often I try to guide people also if you are, there are different ways of looking inside these spaces. So, something which I call like a focused viewing and something which I call more like a peripheric viewing. And this changes very much your perception of the space. And it's very interesting to shift, in once you're in a space inside this, to shift in between these type of modes. So, for example, there are certain people who have generally, from their body knowledge, already a more peripheral vision than, than often the people who are very focused with the view. But here is, uh, now here there's a shot which shows a little bit 
what immersion this can create. I have this feeling at least it shows on that 2D, 2D Im uh, image what these scenes can generate. Yeah, and this is just for the end a little bit. Uh, some public coming in and out, so that well, there was um, quite a lot of movement. We we triggered all the data, which means every, but this took place only from January, so the exhibition opened 15th of December. We didn't manage to implement this this tracking of data, and what I mean with tracking of data. We analyze, uh, so we, we, we implemented afterwards in January, after a little break, uh, a program which, which registers what time, when people were triggering what, which sequence. And now we are in the process of, of analyzing this, which is very interesting because we have in this, in this period of time, we have uh, something like 7,600 40 uh, triggers taking place, which, which uh, represented, we looked at the numbers, which represent a little bit about the, the installation was running four to five hours per day con constantly. And we even now we are looking at, and we don't know what data we can get out. This is very interesting. For sure we know when you analyze data, how you look at data, you will find your answer maybe, but we try different, we will try different versions. But what is for us interesting if, is uh, can we find correlations when people stopped uh, watching something or when people engaged longer? For sure, we never saw the people, but a person, but we see, we know exactly because we know how long each video is, when the next video was triggered, what was taking place. So this is one of the next steps which uh, uh, we, are, we are now doing with this future room part. Another next step which is now taking place, which is uh, a taking place in the next three weeks. We will present this future room, which was now in a six meter dome. We are just working on an adaptation for a larger dome. And for us, it will be giving me a lot of information also in this idea about how, how does the scaling, how did it work? Because we conceived everything for the six meter space. And because it, what, what I said earlier, the scaling is a very big, big element. And once we are in a dome, I could show you also what this means on a physical scale. And I'm just about to be at my end. I just wanted to say that people who are interested of you who, to visit this dome, you can make appointments with me. Normally, I wanted to do this today here, but we have some technical issues in our new lab, which is our moving. And the main technical issue is that the tram is driving all the time, and not the train, the train underneath our dome space, so it makes it shake, and every one and a half hours the images are not tuned anymore. So therefore, so there, yeah, we just encountered it now, so it's a bit annoying, but uh, therefore, if those people who are interested to get a guide with me for visiting this lab, I can arrange, I, I take your numbers, and then we can arrange in the next weeks a visit. That's somehow now where I am. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.